And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are back on another rendition of the b &H virtual event space. And we are here with Jennifer McClure, photographer. Um, I also want to thank Leica, our sponsor, for this afternoon's presentation. And Jennifer is going to be talking about using your personal life to make photo projects. So it's something that a lot of people, photographers of all levels, have been kind of forced into by the pandemic and quarantine. We're looking at what we have uh, at our disposal. Uh, for Jennifer, she's no stranger to it. She's hopefully going to provide a lot of insight on her creative process and uh, give us some ideas about how we can take what we know and turn it into art. So Jennifer, welcome to the virtual event space. Wonderful to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. We're excited to have you here. Yeah. It's funny, I always feel like I'm showing people my diary when I give a talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's like as photographers, sometimes, I mean, some people are just better showing their their life and their thoughts in pictures than they are with words, or they're too lazy to write like me. Well. Well, and I also feel like I didn't share anything for like 30 years. And so when it came out, it just started coming out. <laughs> <laughs> there was no controlling. It was just like it the dam no, broke. Totally. That's what happened. <laughs> hey, I mean, I did get a sneak peek at the images. So, you know, spoiler alert. I mean, I wish I could overflow images like that, how, how you did. <laughs> I mean, for, for a lot of us, you know, it's like, eh, we keep it bottled up for a reason. Yeah, but it helps so much to get it out. Once you get it out and you look at it, you're like, oh, that's what's going on there. It's so helpful. Yeah, for me. I guess. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, some people are sitting there like, yeah, no, no. But yeah. you're right. I mean, you get it out there. You look at what you have in front of you. And that's how you grow. You know, you know what you didn't deliver on, what you can approve upon. And especially when you're when you're looking, you know, when you're talking about images and evoking emotion or evoking a certain feeling from them if you it's easy if you look at it and you don't feel it you know you have to go back to the drawing board or why is this not connecting exactly exactly and sometimes Wonderful. something connects with you and you were there so it means something but it doesn't mean it always translates to something other people can understand exactly okay should i start yeah, go for it. Hey, they didn't come here to see me. That's that's for sure. <laughs> okay, I have a lot of work, but I'm going to go through it fast. So if you guys have any questions, feel free. Okay, are we on? Yes, ma'am, we're good. Okay. Hold on. Okay. So uh, just for some context, I took photograph. I made photographs for around five years before I actually got to a point where I felt like I was telling my own story and using my own voice. And before that, it was just technique and trying things here and there, but there wasn't really a personal connection for a long time. It takes a while, I think. And you've got to give yourself time and space to just learn the craft before you get going. So this is a project I don't show much anymore. It's not on my website, but I want to show it just because it was one of the first things I did that helped me grow and change. Um, I was having some health problems and I was exhausted. And so I went to work and that was about it and a class here and there. But I show this just so people can see that you can still make a project out of that. Even if you don't feel like leaving the house, you can use what's around you to process what you're going through. And so all the photos I made were about how I felt like I was sleepwalking through my own life and about how I felt a little frozen in time and also older, old beyond my years. And this project kind of feels heavy to me. It just feels like not much happens, not much changes. But for me, it was really cathartic. It was a big deal to go through it. And this is when I started feeling better and going back out again. Which leads me to my next project, which is the first one that I, instead of just processing what was going on, it was something that I concepted and that I worked on. 
And so what happened was, after I started feeling better, I thought, okay, let's start dating again. Let's see what that looks like. And I thought I should learn from all of my past mistakes and find out what all these men I dated had in common so that I cannot repeat that again. And I set this series in hotel rooms because of a Raymond Carver short story that I love about a couple who locks themselves in a hotel room with a bottle of booze to figure out if they're going to keep going or end the relationship. It's gazebo. It's a great story. And so I thought, let me do that. And also, again, speaking of, you know, we were talking earlier about our personal spaces and how hard it is to shoot in your own home. I think for me, that's why I also chose the hotel rooms because they felt clean. Uh, they were exciting to me. They felt different and they didn't have all my clutter and they didn't have any personal stuff. And honestly, that's how I felt like my relationships had been kind of impersonal. And so I used friends, I used people I knew, and we recreated some of these breakups in the hotel rooms. And I would shoot before they came over. I would shoot after they left because I feel like, you know, until you are living with somebody or married, you know, it's kind of how relationships are. There's the one you're in when you're together, and then there's the way you think about it in your own head when you're apart. And what I realized doing this series, which I didn't plan on realizing, is that I was <laughs> the common denominator here, which was shocking to me. I didn't go into this thinking that's what I was gonna learn, but I was willing to keep going long enough to allow something different to happen along the way. And I think that's, that's an important, thing to know about doing personal work is that you can't go into it knowing the ending. You've got to allow some room for growth and knowledge. And this one, actually, this is one of my favorites because uh, I went to Paris. I just decided I had to get out and it was a big deal for me to go to Paris. You know, I worked in restaurants and I didn't have a ton of money, but I said, screw it, I'm going. And a friend introduced me to this guy who was an actor and she came over and translated for us because I would always tell people this is the scene and, and we would end up acting it out. It was never really planned, but it just naturally happened. And in doing the acting out, I would actually, I would say some things I never said the first time around. And people would say things to me that I realized must have been in, the head of whoever I was in a relationship with, and it was illuminating. So he and I didn't even speak the same language and she left and we still managed to act out the original intent. And this is how I like to date man children. And I had some help shooting some of these. It's hard with self-portraits. You wanna always do it yourself and put it on a tripod, but sometimes you need a little help and you have to ask people to push some buttons for you. And with this series too, sometimes it was so funny. I would pick out the room online and then I would show up and they would give me a different room that wasn't the one I had envisioned. And I would have to make up stories about it's our anniversary, please. Can we just, it's just, we need a nicer room. I've been planning this forever. And so this is the end of the story. And this is where I looked at all these photos as a group and I realized here I was in the middle of all these scenarios. All of my relationships had all been just about me and what was happening in my own head. And once I realized that, I, I was like, oh my God, that's it. This project is over, it's finished, I'm mortified. And so then I went to therapy <laughs> and I made this next body of work um, called Laws of Silence. When something is festering in your memory or your imagination, laws of silence don't work. It's like shutting a door and locking it on a house on fire in hope of forgetting that the house is burning. And so in this project, I looked back at a lot of my past my family of origin, my history, to find out why I had this view about relationships that I 
did put myself in the middle, how I could overcome that. And also wondering why I felt like I needed to get married and have kids and have a job. And it's about personal myth and looking back and finding out whether that's something I really wanted or whether that was a narrative that was created for me. And I think a lot of people deal with this with their families. And this one, I just started shooting. You know, I did a lot of writing. Um, and at first I didn't see all the connections. I was just going on gut instinct. I would feel something, do some writing, and then start shooting. And it kind of all made sense towards the end, like the previous project. But what I realized as I was shooting is that a lot of the same symbols and metaphors were coming up. Once I realized they were coming up, then I was able to keep going in those directions. You know, disconnection and feeling like I was holding myself back. This one is just about not knowing. And I realized the water came up again and again in my photos. And so I really had to sit down and think about what water meant to me. And when I was a little kid, I had an experience, a really bad experience where I won't say I almost drowned, but you know, it was it was a bad experience. And uh so I was kind of afraid of the water after that, and I would never go in too deep. And I realized that's how I was with my relationships. My childhood wasn't the most awesome ever. We moved a lot. There was a lot going on. And so I was kind of afraid to replicate any of that. And as I was making this project, I was reading a ton of literature, the same things over and over. And this is from the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And it's about fear, about letting fear hold you back. And this was letters from boys in high school and all my corsages that I'd forgotten I'd saved. And at one point my parents said, you need to come home and clean out all your stuff out of our attic. And that's where I got a lot of this source material. And also on that trip, we ended up doing a lot of talking about stuff that went on in the past, which is something we had never done in the 40 years prior. And that was because of this work. It opened the doors for that. And that's a streetcar named Desire. My family is very Southern. So there was this idea that you get married early. And that's very Southern as well, and my mother's old prom dress, and a letter from my grandmother asking me when I was going to get married. I would think I was 22 at the time. And at some point I'm showing this work to people and I have people saying there needs to be some healing, like something has to happen. And I realized that personally, I needed to have some healing as well. And again, the photographs took me there. I wouldn't have been able to get there without making this work, just getting it out of my head. Um, and so after I did this project, I realized that getting married, having a kid, all that stuff, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted for myself. And at this point, I was in my early 40s, and you read the statistics about getting married, being single, and I realized I probably never would get married. And so I wanted to really look at my life and see what that would be like, you know, and make peace with it and say, okay, if this is what the future holds, let's take a good hard look at it. And so I did a project on single people in New York City. And I would give them a set of questions and we would talk about their favorite things, their least favorite things, whether they felt pressure from their family, and I would ask them where they felt the most single. And then we would shoot where they said. And I love shooting this project because it was always a surprise. I never knew what to expect. And that's the dining alone that I think single people know very well, which I actually miss these days now that I'm not. 
And I'm still figuring out how to integrate the text with this project because I do think that's important. And the more I talk to people about this subject, the more I realize I would be okay being single. It would be fine. But I also realized that I had never really given a relationship a try. I'd never fully committed myself to something. And that was the part that I couldn't live with, is that I hadn't tried. And I thought that would be a shame if I go my whole life being too afraid, and that's me in my hotel room, which is a comfort zone, apparently. And I love this because I could connect with so many people and we could have conversations that you, I mean, you can't have these conversations when you meet somebody over coffee, really, and you don't know them that well. <laughs> it would feel quite intrusive. And so when I got to the end of this project, as I said, I realized I'd be okay, but I thought I wanted to try. And so I told the guy that I had been seeing on and off, I would like more. And it was this project that enabled me to do this. And I said, if you don't, that's fine. I wish you well. I hope everything works out for you. And then a few months later, we got married. And to my surprise, I got pregnant on my wedding night. And then I made this body of work about the pregnancy. And it was a shock to all of us. I was 45 years old when I got pregnant, 46 when I gave birth. And so there was a lot of anxiety about whether it would even work out. And I had done all this work previously on not needing to be with anybody, not needing to get married and have kids. And then here I was. And I, part of me felt like a hypocrite and part of me felt, what about me? What about this identity that I've worked so hard to carve out for myself? Where is that gonna go? You know, so a lot of these photos are about my fear of disappearing entirely. And then also my body just took over and I, I just became this huge vessel you know, everything felt awkward and off and I felt enormous and off balance. And so I was trying to show a lot of that as well. And again, the water keeps showing up. I can't get away from the water. I love it. And this one is obviously about all these changes. It's such a dramatic change in a person's life. And then there we are giving birth. And I wanted this project just to be about the pregnancy because it is such a special time in someone's life, even if it is fraught, even if it's scary and awkward and bizarre, but I wanted to have a document of that. And then my recent work, which is work I made since the quarantine. I made some work after giving birth and in that first year, 18 months of her life, but honestly not too, too much. Just because as anybody who has a newborn knows, they take up a lot of your time. And I was exhausted all the time. And I'm sure I let my own vanity get in the way of taking more portraits with her, which now I regret. I wish I had just gone ahead and done that. So I do have some work from those first 18 months, but I still don't know what to do with it. And I still haven't figured out. And then the quarantine happened. And all of a sudden, I mean, I guess everybody here is going through the same thing. It was terrifying at first. We didn't know what was going on, especially in New York City. And we were afraid to leave our house. You know, my husband and I are both at a higher risk and we didn't want to take any chances. And especially with this kid. I mean, it was kind of a miracle that this kid was here in the first place. And we didn't want to be responsible for messing that up in any way, shape or form. So the baby and I stayed home for almost a month and my husband would go out and get whatever supplies we needed. And I just started making photos as a way to stay sane. 
honestly, because I would wake up just so full of anxiety and dread, you know, I'd read the news before I went to bed and then I would have these terrible dreams and just wake up like not knowing what to do with myself. And it's the kind of thing where all obligations were stripped away. You know, I felt like any projects I was working on before didn't matter. Everything stopped. I didn't need to keep submitting to things. I didn't need to have any other work going on. It was this. And I was fully present just taking photos of my kid and my family. And I posted a bunch of these on Instagram. And I guess that's how people started to see it. And it became sort of a different thing after, I became more self-conscious after people started to see it. But I keep trying to come back to these original days where I felt like it was just us. I was just documenting what we were going through. I was looking for some magic and for some escape. And I also, given that we were high risk, I wanted to capture these moments. You know, it was terrifying, but there was also a lot of joy. So I wanted to make sure we had this, we had it on record. So at some point, somewhere down the road, someone could say, here, this happened. And, you know, we spoke about this too. We have a lot of clutter in the house. And so uh, this is sort of the first series where I feel like I was shooting with the same light and a consistent style. All my other projects have different kinds of light, different scenes, which I'm fine with because I think life has different lights and different scenes. But in this, just because we were in the same environment day after day, these do have a more similar feel. And a lot of the light that I use is just simply a matter of trying to eliminate clutter. So I really focus in and expose for the highlights and try and get everything else dark. It's just a trick. Eventually I embrace the clutter and now I show it some more. But in the beginning I was like, no, we're, we gotta get rid of it. Um, this was our front yard. This was the only exercise we were getting. And you know, desperately trying to keep this kid entertained without having the TV on all day, every day. And then I realized, okay, we have these things, these elements from the quarantine that are showing up in our lives. So if it's happening in our lives, it needs to show up in the photos. And I was thinking about the mask and the gloves and what does it mean to a toddler who's learning how to read people's expressions so that they can process emotions. And I started to take some pictures of these. And these are more set up. I realized I needed to isolate what was going on. So I have a backdrop stand and just a black curtain that I put up and I got a light for this stuff because this child moves too fast for me to use natural light. And these are lit. And so these are a bit different from the more diaristic ones, but it's all the same story. She loves the hand sanitizer. She chases us down for it. And now she's at the point where when we leave the house, she'll say mask, camera, which is super interesting to me. And I also started to take some photos that I didn't think had beautiful backgrounds, but I thought this is an important detail to show the passage of time, you know, the trees with no leaves. I eventually realized that we're gonna go through spring and summer and these will have leaves on them and then fall. And when you're doing a visual diary, I think you have to pay attention to these details and recurring objects and recurring themes. and the hand washing, which she still hates. And the gloves eventually, I think we all stopped wearing those so much, those became play toys. And so I started also trying to think about what do we do in the course of a day? What are our actions? And I set out to record most of these. And again, just to have it on file, like I didn't know what I was gonna do with any of these. I didn't know how they would turn out. It was a different way of working for me and that I wasn't, I mean, except for the ones that are set up with the light, but with these, like I wasn't concepting it. I wasn't planning it. I wasn't picking out outfits. It was just us doing what we do. And then we started going outside again. About a month later, I think we realized that we needed to get out. We'd been indoors forever. This child needed to run around. And so we figured out places we could go where she could run. 
And, you know, a lot of people left the city. They just bolted. And so there were certain places that were empty, like college campuses. You know, you could go there and she could run for hours. And with the going out, there was also the need to pull her back in. You know, part of me really loved that month where it was just us and we could bond. And I, I mean, that's great. You want your kids to separate, obviously, and be individuals, but there's also that part of you that just wants to grab onto them. And again, this is one later on where you can see all the leaves on the trees and our thank you sign that we put up for the first responders and essential workers. And this is trying to show just how great it felt to get back out there. And then I'm still shooting some of my own shots in there and trying to figure out how this goes. And again, this is like reading my diary and that I'm showing you a work in progress and I'm not sure what it's all going to be. Um, we always feel the need to have something perfect before we put it out there. And this is one about how I do feel like everything that's going on right now is about my kid. And I'm not sure where I am in all of this. And that's her little cluttered corner that I finally started showing more of. And anyone with a kid also knows that having the playgrounds open up was life changing over the summer. And we spent a lot of time there. And I mean, it's interesting with the playgrounds. I felt like we went to the same places over and over, the same parks, we did the same actions, we ran in the fountain. And it becomes a challenge to really show these things in an original and creative way. And it can actually be fun when you think about it. You shoot all the expected shots over and over, and then you're left to play. And there's so many ways you can play. Like you can change your your focal length, you can change your shutter speed, you can get up high, you can get down low. It's really interesting to try and keep it fresh. And then we went away. Uh, we were supposed to take a big family vacation, but there were quarantine concerns and flight concerns. So we ended up having this place to ourselves for quite a while which was awesome for her to just get out and play. And we had a yard. And it's also hard when doing a visual diary to move beyond a snapshot. And it's hard to really fully explain the difference between a snapshot and a photo that works. And it's hard to make. And I think the way to do that is to just keep shooting. You know, as you go about your day, you shoot the shots of whoever you're shooting a photo of will of course pose in the beginning, but if you just keep shooting, they'll stop and they'll let their guard down. And that's when you can get creative. And again, this keeps coming up, how I feel like I'm a little foggy and disappearing. And I don't know what all these mean. I don't know what this is going to be in a year, but I do know that on a personal level in recording my life, I feel like I have some control over what's happening with my days, which is kind of huge right now, given how crazy everything is. And again, there are things that I didn't want to show. Like I don't love taking mask photos, but this, this is what's happening right now. These are our lives right now. We're all wearing masks, so we've got to get those in there. And this is when she started playing with friends again, and she's a little awkward about it, but we're trying. And this is what we're going to be doing for this winter. You know, we sit on the floor, we play with her toys. <laughs> it's a lot. I think most parents are a little terrified of this winter when we don't have the playground. And so we're trying to enjoy that now as much as we can. And we used to fill our days, we would have classes and play dates, and now everything's outside. It's all weather dependent, but we're trying. And that's all I have. And these are ways that you can get in touch with me. I'm always happy to answer questions if people don't want to ask those here. And that's it. That was awesome. 
I wanted you to, I wanted you to keep going. It's like, you had me like in like the <laughs> zone, like my mind was going someplace else. It's great. It's great to see there's people who are very accomplished at conceptual things and it's, there's people that struggle with it. I've always struggled with it. It actually leans into our, our first question um, from Katie, who's joining us here on Zoom, asking what you mean when you say the concept of something you concepted. Um, Katie says she has a, you know, some guesses after what you, what you mean by that, but she wants to hear your insight on it rather than her guesses. So when you talk about the conception of an idea, can you talk a little bit about your process, how you conceive ideas, where do you draw your inspiration from, what do you put into actually enacting that idea and bringing it to life? Well, I mean, with the hotel series, that presented itself to me. And then I took those parameters of the hotel room and the breakup and the before and after, and then I repeated that. So that's how that concept presented itself. Um, and lately I haven't been able to replicate that. It's been hard. And with the singles, once I got that down, you know, that I was gonna photograph people where they felt the most single. It took a while to get there. You know, that was about 10 shoots into the project. But then once I had that, I was like, okay, here's where we're going with that. Because then the setting made itself available and then I could help direct them. And then now with some of these conceptual shots, I mean, I feel like I'm swimming in the dark. You know, I don't know where I'm going with this yet. I haven't had that moment where it clicks and I'm thinking, okay, this is what's happening. But I do know that the ideas for the concept comes from something that happens in my life as I'm shooting and I take note of it and I, I'll say that, that's the thing. And then I fill it in with the way my life is going. Is that a coherent answer or? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you lost. No, totally. I mean, it's you're you're in it, and I think you bring up a great point. It's like you know we talked about it before we went live today. How nobody has an answer for what we're going through right now. So you're literally taking an idea that's not even really a formulated idea, like it seems the other ideas were in the past. So you had these ideas in the past that were completely conceptualized to the point where if you weren't getting the right hotel room, you knew like this isn't the right aesthetic for what I have in my mind. And now you're just kind of, you're winging. I mean, you're dealing with a pandemic, a situation we've never dealt with before. You have the, the variable of a young child who good luck trying to get any direction out of that. It's like, I have a three-year-old and if I were to do a project that's centered around it, you know, I, I love how you talked about the idea of just, you know, running with the clutter. And some, some of these concepts and ideas, you just have to incorporate them in as you go because there's no planning for it. So yeah, totally, it's totally a coherent, I mean, I'm, I'm like right there with you and you can see the, the delineation between having a clear cut concept and then taking in a general idea and just capturing with it. But with that being said, you know, one of my notes I, I wrote down as I'm, I'm looking through the images is you have such a cohesive aesthetic on like on this most recent project, the use of shadow and light was beautiful. And it was no matter what situation you were in, whether it was, you know, a dimly lit room looking out, you know, with a kid looking out the window or whether you were outside, you know, like a vacation type of shot, it still had a similar feel. You're, you're the play between shadows and highlights and light and dark and, you know, your color scale is just, it was beautiful. It all translated the, in the same language, if that makes, if that's a coherent thought. No, it is. And the funny thing is, I didn't realize I was doing this. You know, I was just taking photos that felt right to me and I didn't know why. And I would post them on Instagram, which again, like I have, you know, that maternity project, that's not on Instagram anywhere. It's barely on my website. Like I get that protective, but with these photos, I wasn't, I just put them out there. And then it was having a couple of people who I really like and respect on Instagram. Actually, I think it was Maggie Stever and Sarah Terry. 
separately. And they said, you know, it's the darkness, the darkness is working for you. And it's like a dark fairy tale. And it was other people telling me what they saw in my work. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, maybe that's the concept I'm going towards now. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it does take like that outside perspective to, you, you might just be kind of, to use your term, swimming in the dark with certain things. And then you yeah. have, you see that light and someone points you in the direction and especially someone that you trust their opinion, their artistic vision saying, hey, this is what I see. This is the direction I see it going. Um, now I want to get to one of our questions. Dr. Danya is confused on the photos of yourself. So were you, what, what, different um, techniques did you employ? I know you talked about, you know, having someone work the camera for you, tripod. Was there one that dominated the other? Or was it, you know, I know you were in the middle of a conceptual project, but did you find yourself winging it at any time? Sometimes you have to wing it. I always tried to keep it on a tripod or set it on a table or whatever it took. And for that first series, I was working with a wireless remote. So a lot of time you only see one of my hands. And that's because of the remote. And then there would be some times where the idea that I had, I just didn't see how it would be possible to get that done. You know, so I have one shot, for instance, where I'm hugging a married man and you can see his wedding ring. And his wife was a good friend of mine. And so I would tell her, uh, you know, you get all your settings, you get all that done, and then you hand them the camera and you tell them, this is what I'm thinking and they would help shoot. But the majority were on a tripod, but I'm incredibly grateful for the people who helped out pushing a button, you know? And it is more than pushing a button, actually. Like, they're looking, they're helping. I'm a big believer in collaborations of all kinds, and I do consider some of those a collaboration. Definitely, I mean, it's, it's not like you're one of these uh, unnamed, big photographers that we all know where it's like you know you have a 50 person crew and they literally just walk in like all right don't get yeah. done it you know it's it's it is and, and that's kind of I think that's cool you know when you were talking about incorporating people into it a lot of people wouldn't bring that detail in a lot of people think well oh well then am I really creating and it's like well yeah I conceived the entire project the project is my brainchild but the incorporation of you know, someone coming in and yeah, having to frame it and not just coming in and literally pushing a button. It, it kind of makes it, it adds an interesting dynamic to it that makes that collaboration a little more meaningful. It is, it is. And you know, I teach classes on self-portraits and this is one of the biggest questions ever. Is it mine if somebody else does that for me? And I think yes, because it's your idea. You're the one who got yourself there in the first place. Someone else didn't come to you and say, I have this idea for a shoot and you're taking it and saying it's a self-portrait. You made everything in that scene happen. And a long time ago, I read that Cindy Sherman for the untitled film stills got help from her father and boyfriends and they would take the photos for her. And once I heard that, I thought, permission. <laughs> you know? It's like that, remember the, the case of the monkey that took the picture and there was the whole big thing, whether like the monkey owns the rights to the picture or it's, <laughs> yeah. I'm probably messing up the details, but that's, yeah, it makes me think of that. And it's like, no, I totally, I see eye to eye with you 1000% on that, that really it's the creative mind behind the idea for the image that the credit goes to because yeah. you, you conceived it, it's, it's yours. Um, Ian actually brings up a, a question. Uh, so Ian is joining us here on Zoom. Ian, I was thinking the same exact thing as I was looking at some of these images. I, I wanted to hear like moody music and then I'm like, Jennifer, you need to do video. So Ian's saying your photos <laughs> often seem to tell great stories. Any plans to move into video or make film? Um, right now i feel like i'm barely catching up you know with full-time baby care like this thing i know how to do i'm barely getting it done <laughs> <laughs> i would love to move into that i think it's fascinating i'm really attracted to video and it's you can do some amazing creative things yeah i mean it's everybody that's the big 
discussion now with still photography is that video is the future and I hear it I'm probably in a conversation about it at least once a day where hey video is where we're all going every still photographer needs to at least have a working knowledge of it yeah. but I, I will say this and this isn't to put any pressure on you um, every once in a while you look at someone's work and you're like wow like you do you have a very um, cinematic feel to your images and when I when I look at your images, you know, just your command of everything. I mean, everything from, like I said, the color, the lighting, the composition, everything does have a cinematic feel that it, I, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm with Ian. I would love to down the line, you know, get things sorted <laughs> out with, the, with what's going on in the world. Maybe, you know, once once the kitty is a little older and can, you know, yeah. stay distracted, it would be, you know, it would be interesting to see, especially given the fact that you've already proven that you can conceive an idea and execute it while getting your point across, which I think is huge as an artist. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to try. You know, around the beginning of this project, um, someone who I'm friends with on Instagram, someone who follows me, I've known her before, but she asked to feature the work in Vogue and she wanted video for that. And so I really took it seriously and took a lot of video of the kid. And I was like, oh my God, there's so much you can do to play with this to make it more interesting than just a simple record of what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Now, we, uh, our next question leads into uh, what's going on over your shoulder there is the, uh, Edward says, he sees the, sh the photos behind your shoulder. It looks like a storyboard. How critical is a timeline when developing concept and or in the display or exhibition of your work? Um, well, generally I use those not for planning, but for editing. Because at some point in the middle of a project, I'll print everything out five, five by seven or four by six just cheap work prints. And I put them all up on the board and I'm looking for connections. I'm looking to see if any of those photographs talk to each other. If there's an element that repeats, I look to see if I have too many shots of her from behind, or if I have too many that are, you know, or of myself in the middle of the frame, like with the hotel series. And it's also just to see if I'm still interested in photos after they've been up there for two weeks. And if I'm not interested in them anymore, then they come down and I, they're gone. That was with the um, going back to the singles project. When so you conceive the idea of the project, as how far do you go in terms of conception to where obviously the photographer has the power to, um, you know, take the narrative in in a direction if you know, if possible. And some photographers leave it very uh, objective and some photographers get a lot more subjective with it. It's, when we think of single, obviously everybody has a different connotation. Some people see singleness uh, as loneliness and some people see singleness as freedom. Was there, you know, how far did you go with conceiving how the project comes across or is received or how your images portrayed the act of being single? Well, that's a very interesting question because I showed this work a while ago, and like I said, I was in the middle of finishing it and answering a lot of these questions when, you know, I got married and pregnant, and it's been a busy time. But when I did show this work, this is what a lot of people said to me. They were like, I don't see your point of view here. You need to have a point of view about being single. And my point of view is that, you know, it is what you want it to be. You know, I didn't think single is good, single is bad. And I felt like that's what people wanted. And I was more like, there's good and bad, there's parts of it. And so I'm still trying to figure out how to make this come across the way that I really want it to. Interesting. I, but people that, did it, want me to have, and it's funny because it was also like a Rorschach test when I showed it to people. Because some people would say, <laughs> oh, they all seem so free. And other people would say, they look lonely. They look sad. Everybody looks miserable. I'm like, that's what you're bringing to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an inner reflection. I love, <laughs> it's funny. I want, now, <laughs> I want you to restart the, restart everything now after picking your brain and look at everything again and see, wait, hold on. How was I looking at it? Because I think, 
I think I kind of leaned that way too. Was was it like a a loneliness? I think I I I didn't see like an outward freedom. I did see. I think you know that's what marinated in my head was was loneliness. And, yeah. and it's it is interesting to look at how you can really take yourself out of the equation. It's so hard to do as as a, everybody has an opinion and that us included, you know, when we're creating a body of work. So to take your opinion out of it and really just make it what it is. Well, that's why I think the text will be important. But I did think it was fascinating that the people who were looking at it wanted a clear opinion. Yeah, that it's so like, interesting. Is that? that is that like, and I wonder too, I think about this all the time, how the internet has changed the way we tell stories and consume stories. You know, like people want 20 photos that have similar light, that tell a story that you can flip through in less than five minutes and make sense of it and have an answer. And you're like, there, now I know what happened and you feel good about yourself. You know, there's less room for ambiguity given that this is how we're consuming more of our information these days. It's interesting you bring that up. I was just thinking about that yesterday, how storytelling's changed in the same regard that, you know, 15 seconds. It's like now people are like, Instagram, Instagram story. Now Instagram has the reels. And it's like, you know, we've condensed storytelling into a Twitter, Instagram mindset of where 15 minutes of fame you know when I was growing up it was 15 you get your 15 minutes of fame now it's like five seconds of fame and you're content with it where people don't have the mindset to sit there and comb through a body of work you know it's like are people going to look through a 250 page coffee table book or would they rather see a 15 page zine yeah it's it's interesting that you that you bring that up does that does that play into how you you know, you're my generation. You you came up probably with a very similar thinking about art and storytelling as as I have. Does that play into your your mind at all when you're generating an idea for for telling a story? It really doesn't. It makes me a little sad sometimes, and I think my work might get more traction if I did make work like that. But I can't help but make the work the way I make it. If yeah. That, yeah. I can't no, take totally. my work to the audience. Although there are a lot of successful artists who have done that and there's nothing wrong with that, but I just can't make my brain go that way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like saying, you know, you give somebody, you know, two people the same block of wood Yeah. and one person's going to take six months to sculpt something incredible and one person's going to give you a very elementary design in six minutes and you can't accept or can't expect the one person's product to be delivered in the same amount of time as the other person's product and i think i i, I see you know i definitely see eye to eye with you on that as well that you know you're not letting n followers likes numbers traction analytics whatever term you want to use for it dictate your creative vision and I think that's it's so hard for creatives now to fight the the urge to bow into what people have been asking for and and it's it's almost like uh it's like the fast fashion of of art you know they're not putting the time and work in or you know they might be putting the time and work in but I think the focus is different the focus is traction and not on delivering the vision yeah exactly um, Katie has another question. She says, I really love that you've resisted the pressure to deliver a perspective. I feel like the deeper stories live in ambiguity and nuance. Oh, there we go. This is not a question, just a thank you. So Katie, <laughs> definitely echo those sentiments. Um, okay. it, it is. I mean, I, I, I find that, you know, with, with an artist such as yourself, it's refreshing when, especially being an artist myself, as when I come across another artist that has the similar view to, to you as you are a true artist in the form of you just want to create and you let the work speak for itself. You speak when it adds something. So, you know, when you talk about the text, the text adds context, but you're not letting anything dominate um, what is should be most important. And that's your 
your vision, your artistic vision. That's what I hope. <laughs> I think you're delivering. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at, I was looking at the images and that's what's coming across to me. And it's, you know, it's, you know, we, we talk often about whether you, when you look at an image, do you feel something? You know, that's, that's like the, the general smell test for photography is when you first look at it, you know, before your brain can even, you know, conjure up a response to it, do you feel something? And yeah. looking at your images, I did, you know, I, I felt as you went through each project, the feeling was different, but it was still evocative um, in its own right. So. Well, thank you. And, you know, honestly, I've shown this work, a lot of these projects at a few places, and I've had people say, this isn't doing anything for me. I don't like this kind of emotional work. And I think that's part of the process too. If you're gonna kind of go outside the grain a little bit, you've got to prepare yourself for that. And in the beginning, I used to, you know, I had some portfolio reviews that left me in tears in the bathroom. And after a while you realize, you know what? I don't want to make the kind of work that appeals to everybody. I'm okay with one person saying I feel nothing and someone else saying I really feel something. And I think that's important when you're making personal work to kind of know ahead of time that it's going to resonate with some people and not with others. And that's fine. Yeah. I mean, you, you keep, uh, you keep on bringing it back to this idea of it basically being a, your personal diary, you know, yeah. in one way or another, whether, whether it's, you know, we say the words diary or, or not, that is what your personal work is. I mean, that's what it is. You're, you're reflecting on your experience. Um, and even though, you know, even though you might conceive a, a project like, singles project you know it's still rooted in what you know and what you experienced and your life um, as a single person at that time so it still has a personal aspect to it and i think that's important for a lot of people who are out there watching who might be less sure in their footing than you are when you know you're going to constant critiques and portfolio reviews and people who are looking at your work, yes, they can provide an outside perspective, but ultimately it's, are you happy with it? Are you happy yeah. with your work? Is it delivering the vision that you wanted to deliver regardless of whether somebody can pick it apart or not? Exactly. It takes That's a while to get that confidence. Did, did you find it harder or easier as the content got more personal? So once you know once you have your own family once you have a child it changes you completely it's unavoidable it's it's a biological change that you can't even describe is it harder now to capture that you know to capture an idea to capture your family versus capturing an idea in the past so well it's hard because you're three individuals you know and it's hard to get everybody in your headspace if that's what you want you know so the conceptual part doesn't happen as much with everybody as a group you know it's it'll happen sometimes if we can all get it together and we're all in the right mood and we can all sit and all really try but you know how that is with a toddler <laughs> yeah it doesn't, it doesn't often end well. It doesn't often end well. And what we're finding works better, like with her, is that I can come up with a concept and we can start shooting that, but I have to be okay with it going off the rails and having her do her own thing. And like, I'm, I'm learning how to make that part of the concept. If that makes sense. That's, I use the same thing where... Yeah. You know, with doing a project involving my, my son, who's, you know, on his own, he's on his own schedule, he's run, doing his own show. So you make, you make the unorganized part of the plan. And yes, if, if it's exactly. part of the plan, then, then it goes over better than you trying to say like, oh, well, you know, I wanted this, <laughs> but he wasn't working with me. So no, I, I totally get it. I mean, is that, and I think that's, that's probably for for people who are are wanting to transition into doing something more personal and capturing what they know is what you've done and kind of just you seem like you just go with the flow when it 
plays into you know to a a better creative vision and as in past projects if it wasn't part of your vision and you you kind of separate what has to be vision what has to be conceptual and what has room for veering off exactly exactly so i mean i'm i'm glad i'm like following i'm like hopefully i'm i'm not just throwing out stuff and and you like wait what like when you know when we've all had it somebody looks at the at a picture of ours and somebody comes off and they give you this whole breakdown of the image and you you're just like i was literally i just like how the light came through the window and somebody made you know made it into this whole three-dimensional sixth sense kind of thing and then you're just like no so no, um you're on point <laughs> okay good i mean look it, it shows that your vision as an artist is getting across i mean it, it's always nice to know that people are viewing your work not only saying you create beautiful work but really able to see what the the creative process is behind it Jennifer's just like, yes, yes, yeah. yes. No, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's shocking to me, you know, whenever, like, especially with this recent work, like, it does just feel like what we're going through during the day, and it blows my mind that other people are interested and that they're seeing what I saw. Because for you, it's, it's mundane, I guess. To most people, they say, yeah, it's what I live. Why is anybody, I think, and I think people question themselves when they think of an idea like this, like, Who's gonna care about my son over here in his high chair eating French fries and frozen chicken nuggets? But to somebody else, it's a look, it's a personal look. You know, it's it's a look into what you're going through, how you're personally handling the situation. Yeah, and the thing is I'm fascinated with other people. You know, this is why when I was little I buried myself in books and movies and tell like I wanna see how other people are doing it. And I teach this in my classes and I'll tell my students show me what your life is like. I know it's boring to you, but to me it's fascinating. But then when it comes to my own work, I'm like, oh no, oh no, it's so boring. Nobody would care. Like it's hard to take it and really internalize it. And feel how, much it. Of a, how much of a focus do you put on technical things and aesthetic things? So when you're, when you're taking photos, is it more just a in a in a documentary mind state or is it like okay my daughter's playing in the window i love the way the light's coming in if i get it from this angle are you really looking at it as you would if you weren't taking images of something that was so personal um well i think my light is my light no matter what i i have light that i like you know and sometimes i have light that i don't normally use but it fits the mood but with this it's a combination of light that I like, but also being stuck indoors and having limited light because the light in our apartment, the available light is not good. So I would know, okay, at 2.30 in the afternoon, the sun is gonna come pouring in this window. And I would have my camera there with the settings all ready to go so I could just pick it up and shoot. Now, we're not going to let you go without the inevitable. Um, and, and Ozzy, who's viewing us from our live stream, actually asked it. Gear. Everybody wants to know gear, gear, gear. What's your favorite <laughs> setup or what is your go-to setup? Well, this project has been mostly Leica. Um, I'm using a CL with a zoom lens. It's the equivalent of a 2470 and a Leica Q. And part of the reason I'm really loving those is the touch release function that's on the back screen. Because when you're with a toddler, you know there's not a lot of time to focus and recompose and, you know, so for this, I can just set everything up and start taking photos. And nine out of 10 are gonna be blurry, but the one out of 10 is gonna hit. And so that's what you're, you're looking for. And I'll use sometimes an on-camera flash for that one. I think it's the, I always get this wrong, but I think it's the SB40, which I really love. And then for some of the setup shots, and this is a little embarrassing, but I can only use my Canon with the tripod shots because I screwed the plate in too tight on the bottom. <laughs> and I can't figure out how to get it off. I know there's a way, I'm gonna put it in the freezer, I'm gonna try. 
but in the moment I'm just okay it's time to shoot we've got to do this and then when I'm doing those setup shots I use a pro photo b10 and I'm using a shoot through umbrella with the black what's the name of the cloth that goes on the back Oh, the like like the the damper cloth. Uh, yeah, um, it's the escaping me. Yeah. yeah, I really should know this by now. But the black it, backing oh. that goes mm -hmm. on there—that's what I'm using for some of those shots. Okay. Do you prefer to work with natural light, or do you prefer creating your your own lighting? It all depends on my mood, honestly. But I think probably natural light interesting all right i always like the it's it's one of those things it's like it doesn't matter but it's always interesting to know i think it it shapes how you how you see i think some people can go seamlessly between available light and off camera yeah. and some people it clouds their creative vision it's kind of like you you know working with a prime lens versus a zoom with a prime lens you know you have one focal length to work with and you can kind of settle into that yeah. to that mode so interesting well I'm so glad we got to look at the images. I'm so glad we got to pick your brain on them. As I told you before, I always love when we get behind the creative process. It just mean it makes the images mean so much more when you can hear a little bit about what goes into conceiving them, executing them, even just talking with the person who created them tells you you so much. So I do want to thank you for that wonderful uh look inside your creative process and at your work, Jennifer. A huge thank you also to our sponsor, Leica, for this wonderful event. Um, where can we find more of your work? Can you tell us again? Um, well, my website, which is myname.com. And on Instagram, I am at jmcclurephoto, P-H-O-T-O. And Perfect. that's where so most of the work is popping up. Okay, so your inst I know I always have to ask people. It's like, are you Instagram heavy? Are you website heavy? Some people, it's like, I'm on Instagram every day, but I haven't updated my website since '97. I just put all this work up on the website, the recent work, and I still need to update that because it's all happening so fast. But I would say it's both. All right, perfect. So then, do yourselves a favor, everyone, and do Jennifer's work justice. Look at the website on the computer, follow her on Instagram, check out see, to see what she has going on. Um, Stacy, who's joined us here on Zoom, asked if we showed some images. Yes, we did show some wonderful images, Stacy. So definitely check out the website and Jennifer's Instagram. And uh, Jennifer, awesome work. I'm gonna go on there now and, <laughs> and get, you, get you on the Instagram. We've already had a request to have you back. So Bobby, yes, I agree. We gotta get Jennifer back. Um, to talk about some some more stuff. Maybe we'll we'll give you a couple months in and see where you're at on that some of these projects. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll have you back next week. You got to have a hundred new images. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. This was wonderful. Awesome. Now it's my pleasure to have you on. Definitely enjoyed it, and we will get you back. So a huge thank you again to Jennifer and to Leica and to all of our viewers. We can't do it without you. So until next time, this has been another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Catch you all next time.